ओके हम कैन यू स्टार्ट या या श्योर श्योर गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी आई एम डॉक्टर तनु शर्मा आई एम करेंटली डूइंग माय एफ फ्रॉम सर गंगाराम हॉस्पिटल एंड टुडे आफ्टर हैविंग डेल्ट विद पीसीओएस एंडोमेट्रियोसिस एंड पुअर रिस्पोंडर्स टुडे वी हैव कम विद अनदर वेरी प्रैक्टिकल क्लास दैट इज रोड बैक टू मैनेजमेंट ऑफ इनफर्टाइल कपल्स एंड आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट मैम टू प्लीज गाइड अस थ्रू द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ इनफर्टाइल कपल्स मैम hi good evening everybody thank you for joining me again and this lecture everyone would think that why am i taking such a basic lecture but i thought that this was a very important lecture especially for every gynecologist who is practicing infertility i just wanted to make the investigation and management very simple and that's why i thought i'm going to show you a road map for management when we say management it means investigation and treatment of infertile couples now first thing is infertility is not a disease but it is a condition of life which is to be treated only by choice so underlying disease responsible for infertility may warrant treatment on its own merits so anything which is leading to infertility and for that if the person comes we can treat them but only when they want infertility to be treated then we treat it say for instance a woman who has endometriosis she says all you do is treat my endometriosis i don't want a child so i don't want treatment for that. similarly unexplained infertility or azoospermia unless they don't want we cannot treat it like a disease so road map for managing infertile couple is exactly the same as we manage any other patient which comes in ops gynae medicine surgery we need to take history we need to do examination we need to do imaging and we need to do blood investigations so these four are the most important parameters and we will move in history all you need to do is uh when you ask the woman regular cycle frequency or often denotes ovulatory cycles but sometimes you'll find a patient says oh my cycles are between 26 and maybe 30 days or 32 days or 34 days and yet if you do a serum progesterone on day 25 26 you will find it is less than 1 so this happens in rare cases but mostly if they say they have regular cycles which come on their own these are ovulatory cycles duration of unprotected coitus denotes the true du duration of infertility so very important to ask uh since when are they having unprotected coitus are they having coitus interruptus or are they using condoms or they have very very little coital frequency and believe me all my friends what i have found in my practice that most infertile couples have very very infrequent sexual contacts and if there is coital frequency is low with irregular cycles then i mean how much is the coitus irregular cycles 40 days 45 days 30 days and they have they think that oh fertile period is between 12 to 18th day and they are having contact only during those days or they are not having frequent contacts they have once a week a contact so such people generally miss the chance of pregnancy because ovulation may happen for a 40 day cycle it may happen on day 25 or 26 when the patient and her husband are totally unaware of it that they are ovulating and they've not had a contact for one week in women who have history of abortion it is very important to ask what was your time to pregnancy ttp we call it say if she if she says i tried for 3 months and i got pregnant we know ttp is 3 months she says i tried for 1 year and got pregnant that means she takes a long time to get pregnant and if she wants another pregnancy we need to assist her so in history i feel these few things are very important and um, sexual contact its frequency and regularity of cycles really tell us what true chance of pregnancy does the couple have then we come to examination do not forget to examine your patient an ultrasound or its report is not enough why because once you examine your patient 
first thing you will know the moment you tell your patient, I want to examine you. Please lie down on the bed. A patient who is flinching from an examination, who is thinking twice before going and lying down, is the one who could be having a lot of difficulties in sexual contacts. So, vaginismus, rigid hymen. You get to know it immediately when you make the patient lie down and you start with an examination and you know whether the patient is closing her legs, is she not allowing you a... Uh, per vaginum examination and she doesn't allow a perspiculum at all. So all these things, once you find this, then generally such women also have difficulty in proper sexual intercourse and penetration. Then you also find out congenital anomalies like vaginal septum, cyst and all, which you generally do not know by ultrasound examinations if you do not do an examination. Growths in vagina or cervix, very important to examine the cervix once before starting treatment and there's any suspicion of anything, uh, in, uh, liquid based cytology or whatever you think is required, a biopsy is very important. Do not ignore it. Tomorrow, if the patient is going in for a conception and she turns out to be having some type of malignancy in the vagina or cervix, you will never be excused. And last is, you also with this see the health of cervix, the type of discharge she has either from the cervix or vagina. And most of all, I love to see the cervical mucus because close to ovulation, the cervical mucus, if it is copious, it is clear, it has a good spin bucket, then I know this mucus is very inviting to sperms. So all this you get to know only when you do a local uh, per speculum examination. Then we've got two more things to do. One is imaging and one is hormones. And the whole of infertility management surrounds these two investigations. One is ultrasound and another is a radiological investigation, which is HSG. We don't bring in MRI, CT scans and all because they are all secondary. Initially, all you need is this. And on the hormones, you need seven hormones. If you know about these, you know your reproductive endocrinology. It is FSH, LH, estradiol, which are best done to start with on day two or three of a spontaneous or induced menstruation. AMH, which can be done generally at any time of a cycle. Thyroid evaluation, again, any time. Prolactin, any time. And progesterone is best done in the second half of the cycle to confirm ovulation. So, Seven hormones, if you know when to do them, you are absolutely perfect. And now there is no data to suggest that you need to do thyroid empty stomach or prolactin empty stomach with prolactin. Yes, there is a diurinal variation. And hence, we always say nine o'clock samples are best because if you do them later in the day, say 12 o'clock, there could be a little rise or fall. So rest all the... All the testing can be if the patient has had a cup of tea and a toast or a biscuit or food also. Now, don't be in a hurry to start treatment before establishing the correct diagnosis. Just tell her, I see I need ultrasound. I need these blood tests and I will start the treatment and I need, I need to know where is the problem before I start any treatment. So I'm not giving you any medicines. Don't write empirical vitamins, micronutrients, because she'll be spending money on them. All these are so expensive. They have very little to do with it. So you make a tentative diagnosis on history and examination only. Regular cycles, proper sexual intercourse, enough sexual intercourse, uh, and um, no difficulty. Then you think, okay. The uterus is so mobile on examination. The cervix is nice. The mucus is dripping. So possibly after we see the tubes, which should be normal, and the semen, if normal, then this is unexplained infertility. You have to make a tentative diagnosis on history and examination and then confirm it with your investigations. Scope to change diagnosis and management if investigations show otherwise. Here, I always say that a woman with irregular cycles, especially if she's obese, very irregular cycles, then you generally say, oh, she must be PCOS. But you'll be surprised that 
that a lot of girls are ovarian elutely similarly and you find that and the last is unexplained infertility is the diagnosis of exclusion so you cannot say that you have unexplained infertility till you've not done the three basic tests which i'll come to and once you've done them and you found everything normal then you say oh this is unexplained infertility we do not label a woman with unexplained infertility with the diagnosis of tuberculosis and start ATT if their tubes are patent. So please understand that we don't need to label a diagnosis to women who appear unexplained infertility. And I'll talk to you about this. So what is the diagnosis before writing any medicine? Four main areas to look for. One is ovulation. So one, you've got to know by history. Number two, the easiest I find is a serum progesterone, and especially if the patient comes around day 18, 19, 20 with regular cycles. Instantly, you do a serum progesterone, and if you find it more than two or three, you know that she's ovulated in the right time. Then you can also do ultrasound follicle monitoring and track a dominant follicle and ovulate. And you can even do it with a LH surge, which is good LH surge. She is ovulating. What is the second thing to see? Male factor. So these are the two basic investigations. A lot of, I mean, mostly we have a semen analysis, but a lot of men who are very averse to doing a semen analysis and girls say oh, it's very difficult to motivate my husband to do a semen. You can also resort to a post which means before ovulation has happened if the mucus is good then comes the assessment of uterus and ovaries so these are three important things you see ovulation is good in number morphology and motility then you look at the infrastructure the hardware of the woman's <coughs> <clears throat> fertility organs uterus and ovaries how do you see uterus and ovaries ultrasound examination why because these are solid organs which ultrasound can pick very easily mm. Normal, nice, they are soft. Tensi is HSG. And <clears throat> another test which we do often to confirm HSG findings, especially if tubes appear blocked, then it is laparoscopy. So these are the four important things which you look. And when you find everything is more normal, means she's ovulating, sperms are reaching her well, uterus, I mean, sperm are normal and they are having frequent intercourse uterus ovaries on ultrasound look normal and tubes are patent so we say this is unexplained infertility <clears throat> and then we fit our treatment into one of the standard treatments or a combination of these So, Mami, this is breaking. Uh... What would you say? This is fertility. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. Is it better now? Yeah, no. Okay, I'm sorry. I think. Okay, so <clears throat> I just wanted to tell you that when we say all this, what do we not see? What do we not see at all is. We know that everything is all right. The sperm should reach and they should fertilize the egg. And then the egg should undergo cell division from one cell to two, two to four, four to eight, eight to 16, 32, 64. And all this happens in the tube. All this phenomena cannot be diagnosed. We cannot diagnose all this, that whether a embryo is going or not, whether it makes a blastocyst, whether the blastocyst hatches, does it reach the endometrial cavity in after five days when it's made when it's become a blastocyst and then it has to hatch and then implant so all this mana is unseen and hence even if these factors are normal 20 to 25 percent of couples land up with unexplained infertility where the software and the hardware looks normal but then all the function which happens in the 
uh, hardware by the software, that means by the sperm and egg combining to each other, making an embryo and the embryo growing, cannot be seen. And hence, all these couples go into unexplained infertility. Now, when we say in all fields of medicine, we have medical management and surgical management. Infertility with the birth of IVF, there has come a third line of management, which is assisted reproductive technology. What is medical management in males? It is hypo, hypo or infections of the male accessory organs or extreme obesity. So which where we know that there is a problem, we can treat that medically. In female, what do we treat? An ovulation. There's only one problem which we can treat, which leads to infertility, which is patient anovulation or oligoovulation. What is the surgical management um, spectrum? In male, you can do varicose ligation if there is a low sperm count and see whether it improves or not. That also if it's advanced varicose veins. Vaso, vaso, vasal recanalization. This used to be a lot in the past before the development of IVF and a successful pregnancy rates by IVF. But it is still done in a lot of places. In the females, again, recanalization of the tubes, uh, resurrection of the pelvis and uterus, and our <clears throat> surgery goes up to cystectomies, generally endometriotic cystectomies or any other cyst. We remove cyst and we feel that now the tubes are free to be able to pick up eggs. The cyst was putting weight on the tubes and hence maybe it was not working. And myomectomy, adenomyomectomy, all cases where we feel that this is interfering with conception. Then comes a third branch, which came only with the development of IVF, that is ART. And here there are two portions, IUI, which can be done in unexplained infertility, where everything looks all right. We're just reaching more raw material to the end of the tube, creating more than one egg in the patient and sperm more and, and energized to that part of the uterus where patients there are little difficulties, vaginismus and all. But I'm just talking about the most important indications for this. IVF can be done in tubal peritoneal unexplained infertility. So, how we can treat infertility and NERT or only medical management or these are the three lines in which we need to know that our patient will uh, respond. Ovulation induction also, these are just four important things which you need to remember that either she is a person who has got good estrogens in her body because either she has polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome or she has congenital adrenal hyperplasia, both present in a similar way and both are treated by clomiphene, letrozole, HMG, recombinant FSH. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism can be treated by only HMG or recombinant FSH and LH because these are estrogen deficient conditions. Then, Less defined oligomenoric cycles where you know that, you know, reproductive end and they don't look hypo-hypo, neither they look like PCOS, but maybe their ovarian reserve is going on the lower side and the cycles are becoming less frequent. There we can again treat them with clomiphene, letrozole, HMG and recombinant FSH all. Hyperprolactinemia, again, you use a dope dopamine agonist like bromocryptine, cabergoline, or you treat them with an LH because hyperprolactism. So one thing you found common everywhere, which is HMG, a combination of FSH and LH can treat all conditions. If you're giving HMG, you've not diagnosed truly whether it's PCOS, CH, hypo, hypo, uh, extremes of life with low ovarian reserve or POI and hyperprolactinemia. You can treat them with HMG everywhere. <clears throat> if your diagnosis is correct, most cases will ovulate. Aim is not to achieve ovulation at the cost of increase in complications. Too many days taken to ovulate do not matter. In hypo-hypo, once I was 
an examiner and I found at a center if 10 days of giving gonadotropines did not bring up dominant follicles, they canceled and took these patients for donor oocyte. In hypo, hypo, it may take 20 days, 25 days also. And when we are going to do it may take as much as forty days. You are about the diagnosis. Patients who are very responsive to ovulation inducing agents will ovulate in fourteen fifteen days, but a lot of them may take twenty twenty five. 30 days also. So we have to understand ovulation induction is not only a science but a piece of when we are diagnosing one is don't decide surgical interventions because something needs to be done. See, a lot of people what I see is that when they go to us gynecologists and we see a treatment is give them something like an inducing agent monitoring see whether the egg is rupturing or not three, four, five, six, you're pregnant and then you say I need to three to four failures of IUI cycles then you have to think of the next step and next step is not always surgery same way, you have to be open-minded for laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. There is no place for diagnostic hysteroscopy. Instead, do a 3D ultrasound and no place for diagnostic laparoscopy for tubal potency. Instead, do a good, don't do a diagnostic laparoscopy only to see tubal potency. Yes, you can do it after HSG. If you find that HSG was inconclusive or showed block tubes. And remember one little thing that you've gone in with a laparoscope because you think that, you know, you put in a laparoscope and you find everything is normal, tubes, patent, ovaries, good, everything clear. Then you think, Kuch tu karna hai. let us drill the ovaries, please don't do it. You are reducing her ovarian reserve by 40% by drilling it at times. So when you have IUI cycles failure, at one point of time, we used to do laparoscopy so that we could treat minimal, mild endometriosis and then again try IUI. But nowadays, 20 years down the line, we have moved from to uh, from the year 2000 higher in most centers. I mean, we used to talk about 25% pregnancy rates in IVF 20, 25 years ago, which has come up to 60, 65%, especially in frozen embryo transfer cycles with a single embryo transfer. Whereas IUI is still at 15, 18, 20% pregnancy rates. So people like to resort to IVF more than saying that you do a laparoscopy and whatever you find, you correct it and then I'll again go in for IUI cycles or I'll again wait for one year. Today, the younger generation has no time to wait. So if there is failure of IUI cycles and they've been done well, then the next step may not be laparoscopy. It could be a IVF cycle also, depending on the years gone by and the factors involved. When take up scopies for infertility laparent urology if IUI cycles have failed in unexplained infertility there we can do a laparoscopy to treat minimal and mild endometriosis so right now IVF is available in second tier st cities still not in the third tier cities and hence whoever is practicing in smaller cities with no availability of IVF, yes, laparoscopy may have a role only to treat minimal and mild endometriosis because we know that, you know, if we treat uh, minimal and mild endometriosis, we may get one extra pregnancy every 10 cases. And another one I always say, very important thing is that if we think any test is indicating that she has genetic to 
tuberculosis or she has loved to do a laparoscopy to confirm genital tuberculosis and then start ATT. Uh, same way, we need to be open-minded for hysteroscopy. Ultrasound shows intrauterine pathology, 100% do a hysteroscopy. You've had multiple IVA failed with good embryos. That means recurrent implantation failure. Hysteroscopy again comes into your armamentarium because it might. So you're being able to follow all what I'm saying. You can hear me well. Yes, yes ma'am. We can hear you. Another thing is IUI don't take it lightly. I feel that, you know, if Shiddat se IUI karte hain, to pregnancies milti hain. <clears throat> or bohat sare IVA failures aate hain, those who come to me. And I say, would you want to try IUI while we are waiting for IVA? Chalo, do cycle achha IUI karte. And then for them, give them gonadotropin. He should be ovulating. At least one tube should be patent. And the semen normal or slightly subnormal. Right? Standardize the technique to give optimal. Mom, your voice is breaking again. The bias towards I minimum. Normally, what happens? So we do patients come with two or three IUI cycles, which you also think is very unsatisfactory, and the patient also tells you the same. And um, we just move into IVF. Oh, three IUIs have failed. Come on, go for IVF. So IUI can give us a pregnancy rate of more than twenty percent in unexplained infertility from well-designed methods. The time for insemination, the method of wash the uh, stimulation regime, everything contributes to success. And do not stop them from having natural intercourse before or after IUI, because if your IUI is not well timed, then at least natural intercourse will deposit some sperms into the genital tract and might rescue your cycle where your IUI has gone wrong timed. Be liberal in using gonadotropines if they give better pregnancy rates in IUI cycles. In my experience, I found this, though a lot of papers are coming that clomiphene is good also, but it is always lower than gonadotropines. So be liberal in using it if you are confident about using them. And in unexplained infertility, generally don't get hyperstimulated. You can use with quite a lot of ease and made it all UI. Jump for the, not only cost-wise, but also saying there is nothing next. Now, I'll tell you one cost problem that sometimes people using gonadotropin find that the patient has been overstimulated, especially when they are inducing ovulation in PCOS or for IUI in women with high ovarian reserve. And they say, are chalo, iska IVF kar dete. No. Patient is not psychologically ready for the cost which comes with IVF. Having a natural intercourse with ovulation induction or IUI, so much lower cost. So it is not easy to say you are hyperstimulated, chalo, let's do IVF. No, patients are very unhappy when you push them towards IVF. So always give them another cycle and say, okay, we leave this cycle and we will think about IVF and take you. Last is IVF. Tubes, we all know. I'm not talking about donor cycles or surrogacy. Tubes irreparably blocked on HSG or laparoscopy. Advanced or recurrent endometriosis, frozen pelvis. All cases of male infertility, wherever you can get a sperm, either from the testes or ejaculated. Unexplained infertility. And then comes third-party reproduction. Whenever you need an egg from someone, or you need a uterus of someone, then you have to use IVF. For semen being used, you don't need IVF. IUI should be good enough unless three to six cycles of AID IUI have not led to a pregnancy. It is a good time to move towards IVF, taking these patients as unexplained infertility where semen was replaced and yet pregnancy did not happen. <clears throat> 
Another thing I tell you always when I also tell you to use protocols, ovulation induction protocols uh, for IVF, that use standard conventional protocols. There are so many combinations, permutations, which have developed where you try to use oral drugs and you try to use PPOS or you try to use something else. Use them when you think that they are mandatory. But otherwise, pick up one standard protocol, long agonist or short antagonist protocol, and use it. You will get the best results. And very importantly, don't give your patients luteal phase care. When you write so many medicines in the luteal phase, I'm very happy now centers are coming up which only write one progesterone and a folic acid in luteal phase. But otherwise, the prescription is like contains 10 to 16 medicines in which three, four injectables, three, four uh, um, oral tablets, and I don't know what not. So I'm just showing you a prescription which is easier to follow. Look at this. This is one luteal uh, support. Thyrox. Uh, what is this? Lutefol must be... Uh, then tablet all nine BOH, tablet prostium ES, tablet endogest, tablet dufaston, ecosprin, visalon, zindi 60, hucog, proluton, lonopin, bharglob. Now, this is a prescription, and then you see on the other side, which I have not been able to take 30, 14, and 15 also. So, 15 medicines in the luteal phase. So, this is tablets like this. And injections. Patients have told me that they put alarms for their medicine so that they can have all the medicines in time. And maybe the patient just forgets the most important progesterone and takes all the vitamins and whatever you've given. A pregnancy successful will not happen. Is this prescription better? Just tell me. I mean, patient will 100% follow. Number one medicine is the most important. Number two is less important. Do not forget number one medicine. The patient will never forget to put a gestone tablet, whichever way you give it. So please understand that there are prescriptions which, are, which have less medicines and you would follow them better and your patients will also follow them better. Someone gives you a prescription like the first one, you will not be able to follow. I will injection, what will Very difficult. <clears throat> Another thing is that for all infertility specialists, gynecologists, whoever are planning to treat infertility, please once look at the ovarian reserve, whether you want to see it on the AFC on ultrasound, do a good ultrasound, or you do an AMH evaluation. Don't panic if the AMH is low. Because when patients come to me and I see everything looks normal and they've hardly been married for six months, one year, then I say, oh, it is the AMH scare by which you've come. Because the moment you find AMH is one or less than that, a panic situation comes in, especially for women who are of um, lesser age. And fecundity does not depend on her ovarian reserve, even though IVF outcome may depend on the reserve partly. Because in IVF, we need, we need number of eggs to make embryos. And then in those embryos, we don't know which one will implant. So we need a good number of eggs. Say the Poseidon group says that you need at least uh, five to six blastocysts for women less than 35 and about 10 to 12 blastocysts in women more than 35 to lead to one live birth. So that is a number of eggs we need. But natural pregnancies will happen. Fecundity never goes low. It only goes low depending on age and not on the reserve. So a young woman with low AMH will get pregnant if you push her to get pregnant. Don't waste valuable time. On the other hand, don't waste valuable time with poor reserve and older age women who have been trying for a long time. Women who have been trying for three years, four years, and the reserve is less. Now here, don't say that now I will do IUI and give you a pregnancy. Give adequate trial with IUI in older women if they are married recently rather than resorting to IVF in panic of ovarian reserve. Don't jump to oocyte donation unless one has tried with self-conception or IVF with one's own oocyte, especially in the younger women. Because they need much less oocytes to lead to it. So please don't jump on oocyte donation. 
Last is don't resort to testing and treatment of conditions which you don't understand. You don't know how to interpret the test. You don't know how to treat like lit therapy. Lit therapy was very popular about 20 years ago. It was rampant in our country, but now it is becoming less and less. Now in a day, maybe in a week, I see one or two patients who have received lit. Earlier in one day, I used to see four patients who have received lit. Torch. Torch, what we test is antibodies. It only tells us that there has been an infection in the body. If it is IgM positive, then that infection has happened in the last six to eight weeks. If it is IgG positive, then it has happened a long time ago. People come in panic saying that, you know, my uh, rubella is so high. What do I do? You are immune. Same way they come with CMB. It is. It was last time also it was 450. Today also the IgG is 450. Because you did get this infection and now the, what we see is antibodies. We see early and late antibodies. Only during pregnancy torch is important, especially if you have a low avidity and you have any of these infections IgM positive in the first trimester. Otherwise, in infertile population, this is not important. Latent TB. Don't look for latent TB. Ours is a high prevalent country for latent TB. We have 40% of population which has latent TB. If we start treating our latent TB, where will be the medicines for active TB left? So in a, in a low prevalent zone like the US, Europe, where it is 0.9 per thousand people, their latent TB is the main source of becoming active TB because 5 to 10 percent of latent TB converts into active TB in one's lifetime in 40 45 years. In a high prevalent zone where the environment water has so much TB bacteria, we get 90 to 95 percent of our TB infections from the environment. Someone coughing out the TB bacteria in front of you or the water which has TB bacteria. Whichever way, it is mainly environment. It is mainly the air which gives us latent TB. Now, I'm just going to show you a mail which I received yesterday from... Now, this is how do these cause infertility? You tell me. I mean, torch infections, they are not infections, they are antibodies. How can they cause infertility? Latent TB, where the TB bacteria has not grown in your body, these... TB bacilli are sitting quietly because you received the BCG once in your childhood. So, or you did get a small brush and your quantiferon gold is positive, but they've not multiplied in your body. So, your tubes are fine, your endometrium is fine, and we don't even know how do we assess cure. I've had so many patients who come with quantiferon gold and they say, you know, I got TB treatment with this, but the test is again positive. What do I do? I asked my doctor and she said, no, you have to positive for treatment. And will the treatment help or not? Because we are living in a high prevalent zone. Today you give them ATT. Ideally latent TB is advocated TB treatment only for three months with one or two drugs only. We still give them for latent TB nine months or six months or whatever. And then that test again comes positive. Why? Because we are in a high prevalent zone. It is very easy to have these tests positive again in our blood. So I'll just show you a mail which I got. This is, uh, I'll show you, this was the mail. This is from a girl, uh, girl called Sunny Dhyan Kola at gmail.com. Inquiry about, my sister stays in the USA. She recently did blood test and got latent TB positive. She was asked to do x-ray of chest and the reports came negative. Her lungs are healthy. Doctors there have prescribed her medication for three months to treat latent TB. My sister's medical history is when she was three months old. She was a severely... She was severely sick of cold, fever and cough and had got infection of TB. My parents completed the course of six months medication and after that there's no problem which occurred in her condition. My question is, is it necessary to treat latent TB? And if she does not take the medicine, is there a chance of getting TB in future? So I wrote her this answer. This is a very interesting situation in which your sister is. Because in India, one doesn't need to treat latent tuberculosis at all because India is a country with high prevalence of latent TB, which means 40 in 100. And most fresh cases happen from the environment. However, in the US, because the incidence of latent TB is so low, 0.9 out of 1,000, hence their TB control program advises to treat all latent TB 
so that conversion from latent to active may not happen at all, which is the only source of active TB infection in their country because environment has no TB bacteria. This is because TB bacteria in the environment are extremely rare and all the TB which they have is by conversion of latent to active TB, even though 5% converts. But that is where active TB comes. However, for your sister, in my opinion, ATT is not needed if the test conducted for TB was TB gold or quantiferon gold test on her blood as it will always remain positive for her lifelong. So then she wrote to me, that is correct. They did quantiferon test for her. Are there any chances for the cells to be active in future? The doctor also said in US that it is optional for her to take medication and not compulsory to take it. The medicine she's been prescribed is isoniazid and rifampicin combination therapy, 10 pills once weekly regimen for three months, <clears throat> or rifampicin 600 milligram orally for four months, or isoniazid and rifampicin combination therapy, four pills daily again for three months. So all they say is that you just have to give it for three months. Now, I wrote to her, I don't think she needs to take ATT. Quantiferon gold is an antigen antibody reaction test in blood and hence it does not become active TB. So, you know, there are so many questions that come to your mind when we find latent TB, but we are here to treat infertility and not look for latent TB. We are not treating TB if the tubes are fine. Endometrium is fine. There's no sign of anything uh, active infection in the lungs or in the genital tract, we don't need to look for TB and start treating it. And a last but not the least is that we don't ask the couple to stop sexual intercourse while treating infertility. Even for IVF, we say that in the five, seven days in the first half of the follicular phase, please have sexual intercourse. Later in those who are hyper responders, we ask them not to have a sexual intercourse because ovaries are large and they might, you know, sometimes have a lot of pain due to twisting of these ovaries. But otherwise, sexual intercourse is never no-no for these women. And uh, last of all is don't put your patients to rest or bed rest because exercise improves metabolism and circulation, both of which contribute to better egg production. All you are doing is your infertile woman is having sex to get pregnant, which is the biggest exercise. And here we tell... We are treating you with IVF. Don't exercise. Don't do this. But why? She's not even pregnant. If she had a high-risk pregnancy, we could have told her all the do's and don'ts. Not because she's trying. Regular activity also optimizes reproductive system by stimulating endocrine glands. Sweating out is known stress reliever. And don't stop your patients from exercising or having sexual contacts because if ART fails, she still has a chance of getting pregnant. And I have had one patient in my whole lifetime who got pregnant where we said the embryos are not good and you're not going to get pregnant. And she came out pregnant and she said that she did have a sexual intercourse on the day of XCG injection. So that's all about it. Thank you. And if Tanu Bhavani has joined, then you can go on to questions. Uh, Ma'am, there is one question in the chat box. Uh, uh, for a patient, if we do three to six cycles of IUI, then do lab and treat minimal endometriosis. Then after lab, what treatment we will do for this patient? I Once upon a time, we used to say do lab, see if there's minimal endometriosis, treat it and again go back to IUI. But now that's gone. 20 years down the line, this treatment has changed. We don't do a lab to find out endometriosis. If everything looks normal, we take her as unexplained endometriosis and straight away move into IVF if we have the facility and the patient can afford it. Because laparoscopy also today is quite expensive. Every laparoscopy will cost her, uh, a diagnostic one may cost her 75,000. Deepti, uh, your question is, ma'am, what is your opinion on SH SSG instead of HSG? Well, Deepti, I think you have only one test to see both the tubes. And it is very important to see the outline of the tubes, the spill, the configuration, which you can see better on HSG. On SSG, it may be difficult to see the whole tube. All you see is fluid in the POD and you assume that, yes, the tubes are open or if you have that high type of a SSG, which very few people do. 
then um, you may not be able to you know uh, assess which tube is patent and which is not so ssg in my opinion is not a great test and we try to make it easy because we feel that we can do it ourselves but why can't we just walk into a good x-ray unit have a fluoroscopic screen in front of us where under fluoroscopy we can straighten our cannula make it in alignment with the cervical canal and the uterus lift the cannula forwards or backwards in lieu with the antiverted or retroverted um, uterus and then push the dye and when you push the dye it is like half ml of dye in the first minute and you will find there's never a coronal spasm and oh, your you life passes mm -hmm. off very beautifully so I think if you learn the art of doing a HSG, then you can see the whole outline of the tube rather than in SSG. And in any case, there are proponents of SSG who do it very well. I don't. I love to do HSG and that's why I always say HSG is better. But even the books, all the European journals, all the books say HSG is the standard test for tubal testing and not SSG. Uh, in which patients we cannot skip doing AMH? I think in all patients who present with unexplained infertility, it is very important to do AMH. If a patient is 35, definitely do an AMH. And um, if you are taking her for ART, say IUI or IVF, you must do an AMH. But AMH alone is not enough. I feel it is very important to also, at times, in, especially with low AMH, do a FSH and E2 on day two or three. That gives you a very good idea that this low AMH is really leading to POI or this a low AMH is still leading to normal good ovulatory cycles. Uh, ma'am, the next question is, ma'am, in a young patient with unilateral tubal block, unwilling to undergo laparoscopy, for how long should we try ovulation induction? or IUI before resorting to IVF, given the other investigations are normal? I think you can resort for three to six cycles easily in a young woman who's not willing to go through laparoscopy. And you are sure that there's no pathology of this block tube which you are missing. A lot of time there's corneal spasm. There's no tree, true block also. So please go ahead with IUI three to four cycles. In today's world, we do not say six because... Nobody has a patient, she will run away. She will not stick to you for six cycles. So it is best to do three to four cycles of good IUI. And then you can move into IVF. You can give her time after your IUI that, you know, I've done, nothing has happened. Try naturally for the next three, four cycles. You've already identified her ovulation. So tell her to be more active during the ovulation time. And uh, see if she doesn't conceive, then she will herself come to you, say, in a stipulated time when she starts getting tensed that she is not being able to conceive. Uh, Dr. Sunidhi is asking, in poor responder, we should encourage sexual intercourse throughout COS and trigger? I think yes. Sunidhi, this is so important that, you know, when we say them to have uh, timed intercourse, it is. It adds so much stress to them. And aajkal sab ladkiya app nikal leti hain. And with that app, they start tracking the intercourse. But that app changes with irregular uh, cycles. So it is very good. You tell them that you know, don't stress yourself during the ovulation period. Once your periods have stopped, have regular intercourse. I mean, people have two, three sexual contacts a day. You at least have two to three sexual contacts a week. Use anything which stimulates both of you. Reduce your work pressure. Reduce your evening, uh, you know, outings with friends. Watch movies which, you know, stimulate your mind and which lead to a proper good uh, sexual contact. Uh, Dr. Shreya is asking, in hypogonadotropic... Okay, in hypogonadotropic, hypogonadotropic... A female, female, young female with normal AMH, what should be the dose of gonadotropins and for how long can we wait for the response to come? Will with there normal be... AMH. Very... Yes, uh, Shreya, there could be risk of OHSS in prolonged stimulation sometimes when you tend to jump.
always start with 75 units of at two is to one ratio of recombinant FSH with LH or HMG. And when you use HMG, then you give it for five days increase after five days, then you give it for another five days increase. The small follicles start emerging and then thickness starts growing. I also like to do a, this is the dose which will give you a good follicle in the next 10 days without the risk of OHSS. But if you go on increasing the dose every 5 days, there could be risk of OHSS in these girls also because even hypo-hypo girls could be having underlying uh, policy Nam, your voice is breaking. Hyper responsive ovaries because the highlight you can skip doing AMH in all uh, younger patients who are coming for uh, infertility. Um, and but in unexplained infertility, I recommend doing it. And over 35, yes, you may do it. Uh, Ma'am, is there any uh, uh, maximum Ma time for evening? Tejashree, your voice is cutting off. Hello? So you can again? Yeah, yeah, come on. Is there any benefit of giving mm -hmm. break between IUI cycles or three to six cycles should be done? continuously without a break if we are doing gonadotropin stimulated iui uh, break only comes in when you see cysts coming up after one gonadotropin cycle and you don't want to stimulate the cyst but generally when you start stimulation the large cyst which are inert cysts do disappear it depends on the patient and you continuous is also good and giving breaks in case especially the endometrium becomes uh, abnormal after one cycle stimulation or if there is a cyst which comes up it's bothering you then it is much better to sort of um, give a gap otherwise you can do one after the other cycle Tejashi you were saying something uh, yes ma'am I just want to ask that uh, which are the group of patients in which who you will suspect uh, active tuberculosis what would be the diagnostic uh, protocol right. and you, for you to decide that we should be giving them ATT. My first suspicion of active genital tuberculosis, I am not interested in uh, lung tuberculosis because in the medical college we've seen nine months pregnant women roaming around with uh, being treated for lung tuberculosis. So we need to know that is the genital tract involved. So if there is active tuberculosis anywhere in the body, it needs to be treated whether it is in the genital, in the lung, in the bone, in the brain, in the kidney, in the spinal cord, anywhere, or there is a lymphadenitis. In genital area, we'll suspect straight away uh, tuberculosis when there is a primary complex in the lung. If the quantiferon or Montux test is strongly positive, I would still want to either do a HSG and see the tubal potency. If on HSG, which I have done, I find that, you know, tubes are halfway through patent and then the rest of the tube is blocked or there is a little hydrosalpinx which doesn't look good i would want to i would 100 percent put in a laparoscope convince her that i will give you att but i need to be sure that yes it is because of tuberculosis and not due to other microbial infections or chlamydia which are self-limiting infections all other infections are self-limiting tuberculosis is not needs to be treated if it is there. So I would suspect on an abnormal HSG, I would suspect if the patient comes with screening test where two tests are positive, I would want to do a lung x-ray to see a mediastinal lymph node or a primary complex in the lungs. And um, that's it. Ma'am Bhavani here. Ma'am, there is another perception that uh, TB should be ruled out before doing an HSG as it this can. This is a very new perception, Bhavani. In the last 20 years, I don't know how it came up that you rule out TB by TB PCR. You tell me when we take a TB PCR in the OPD settings, how sterile is the PCR sample? And DNA amplification can happen very easily from any bacteria. So, uh, and tell me, is a tubercular abscess a problem 
a few days or it's a problem of few months and years. A tubercle bacteria grows very, very slowly, even on culture media. So if you do a HSG and the patient does have active tuberculosis, you will not lead to a tubercular abscess. You will need to maybe a polymicrobial abscess. So it is very important to do a good PV, a good ultrasound. And if you find any problems inside like fluid in the POD, or you find you can see tubes which have some fluid in them or you know uh, uh, anything which looks abnormal on your ultrasound finding, the uterus is a little fixed. You will not do HSG. You will go straight for a laparoscopy. So if you do a TB-PCR and it comes out to be positive, we do not start TB treatment. In that case, don't do HSG. If you are trying to do that, then put in a scope and see whether there is true tuberculosis or not. Because where does tuberculosis start in the genital area and the tubes? Tubes are 90 to 100% involved. Endometrium is 40 to 50% involved. And the infection comes from the tube to the lateral walls of the uterus. So a biopsy taken from the lateral walls of the uterus may tell us about TB being present. And if you still want to follow the practice of doing a TB, then please don't do just a TB PCR. Put in, uh, do a histopathological analysis. Take the curettage from the lateral walls. And if your TB PCR comes positive, please don't start ATT or don't do HSG in that case, put in a laparoscope, confirm the diagnosis and then start ATT. This is very important. You do not give such toxic medicines. People give ATT one morning, one afternoon, one night tablet. This is not the way. All the medicines have to be taken before 12 o'clock in the morning. If the patient is unable to take all the four tablets together, then we divide them into two doses and we make sure that within three to four hours, the tablets go in because they all complement each other rather than have different modes of actions. So, Bhavani, does this satisfy your answer, your question? Yes, ma'am. Bhavani? Yes, ma'am. Because if you find, say, okay, it is your practice to do a TB-PCR and it comes positive. Please go and do a laparoscopy. Confirm your diagnosis. Do a X-ray chest. Do a Montux. Do a quantiferon gold. But I feel laparoscopy is a must because tubes are the first thing to get involved. And with that, all the evidence tests. If on laparoscopy, you don't get the tubercle bacilli, you don't get any histopathological evidence, but you find adhesions, you find distorted tubes, you find uh, the, uh, the adhesions between the liver. It could be chlamydia, it could be tuberculosis. But if Montux is strongly positive or quantiferon gold is positive, I would treat it as tuberculosis in our country. So if you have other supportive tests and a laparoscopic evidence of some involvement of the pelvis, go ahead and give it to the patient. But you won't do a HSG in that case. But if you've done a HSG, there is no risk of infection or pelvic abscess. Because tubes are generally blocked. And if they are not blocked, if they are blocked, how does it go into the... And if you please see that you're, there's no vaginal infections, the vagina is clean, and there is nothing which on ultrasound says the uterus is retroverted fixed. Because in all these conditions, HSG is in any case contraindicated. You go in for a laparoscopy to assess the tubes. This is very important information that uh, Abba Ma'am has shared today. And it will be very... Uh, important that all the fellows and DNB students remember this for their life while they are practicing infertility. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this clear thought on tuberculosis. Thank you, Tejashree, for joining. You were on leave, going out, and you've joined in suddenly. Can't miss your lecture for anything. <laughs> I'm Thank out, you. can't uh, switch on the video. I'm out somewhere, but this yeah, it was girl, a very pretty girl, Swati Gagre. From where are you, Swati? You've got a very good, nice picture over. <laughs> so I was just wondering. Deepthi Goswami has just switched on her camera. Chalo, thank you very much. We are done with our lecture today. And somebody asked me to uh, talk on ezospermia. Who was that? Is that girl still here? She said, I want you to tell us how to deal with ezospermia. <laughs> So that would be a little advanced talk, but I'm I'm happy that I'll give it on that next turn. Okay, uh, Mr. Dave, 
thank you yes. very much for yes. always making this available to us yes. and manas i i really thank you yes. das for giving us this platform of learning i am ready to teach and so many of the fellows are there i'm so happy to see all of them but you are the one who has made it possible for us thank you so much you have given thank us you. a chance at least this academy can go to everyone and it is free to hear from your side yeah yeah and i'm putting the master classes on the website also so that anyone who wants to uh, attend can go on to that who has not been able to attend thank you thank you everyone Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Should I start? I just now? just wanted to make one point. Any question which has not been answered, you can put it on the WhatsApp group. Ma'am will answer it on the WhatsApp group. Yeah, also. and you know, I want you all to also give me you know suggestions because tuberculosis is very close to my heart. Especially when I came into practice, I saw girls getting right. मतलब एक कर से infertile होना, बांझ होना और दूसरा कर आ जाता था TB है. I have seen mother-in-laws telling their sons, "Don't have intercourse. Is ko na uterus ki TB hai, tumko bhi ho jayegi." This was the status, you know, in in the earlier days when I came, and I started thinking that the whole tuberculosis, it is lung tuberculosis. Just having tubercle bacilli inside you doesn't make you infertile. It has to affect your genital tract. Then only, or Tuberculosis में half open tubes में ectopics होती हैं, so how do we say? We always study this, read this कि tuberculosis treated tuberculosis में ectopic का rate high होता है, so please do not think that having latent TB or um, TB bacteria elsewhere in the body is going to make you infertile unless you have genital tuberculosis. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. I'll take a lecture on TB once. Yes, I'm sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tanu, for coming and helping us. Bhavani was doing a cesarean, so she couldn't join in at the beginning, and Tejeshri was on leave. Okay. Bye, bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good you. night. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, ma'am. Okay.